1 Peter 1, 15 to 16 reads, As he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. All right, cool. What the hell does that mean? What is holy? I don't know what that means. Then we have a passage which is completely misrepresented in Hebrews 12:14, saying that without holiness no man can see the Lord. And I suggest that that not only doesn't mean what you've been told it means, but it really doesn't mean what you've been told it means. We'll get to that later. First, we got to deal with the fact that we need to be holy, or so it says in 1 Peter 15 and 16. And it does reference to passages in the Old Testament. But it says, be ye holy. What does that mean? And so now is the part where I suggest to you that you've most likely been taught completely wrong what the word holy means. So my investigation and my suggestion is that holy deals with health and healing and wholeness. And it doesn't mean follows the Ten Commandments. It doesn't mean separated yourself from everybody else and acts like a weirdo so that you just can't be like anybody else because they're the world and you're separate from the world. So the idea of holy, like I think of the song where they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And I have these parodies of what holy would be, you know, so you have holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who doesn't drink or smoke or gamble or have promiscuous sex, and he never snorts cocaine or looks at pornography. It, those things might be true, but that's really a weird definition of holy. First of all, you're defining it in the negative. God doesn't do these things. And so... I've also heard the idea that holy means completely otherly different than anything else. So the idea that God is holy is the idea that God is strange, odd, bizarre, unrelatable, doesn't communicate properly, writes, uh, communicates to humanity by writing a book that nobody understands using terminologies that everybody's gotten wrong. Uh, doesn't use metaphor or sarcasm like people do when they communicate. Uh, all other kinds of strange, odd ideas about what holy is that makes God weird and unrelatable. Rather than God that's Emmanuel within us and with us. And it also means, as is characterized typically, separation. And so you separate yourself from, quote, the world, end quote. And you dedicate yourself wholly to God, whatever that means, which probably means religious works that elevates religious works above acts of kindness, which is the definition of hypocrisy. When reading your Bible is more important than having a conversation of, with a person in distress, that's hypocrisy. When tithing at your church is more important than helping somebody that actually needs financial support that you know and you actually have the means to give it to them, that's hypocrisy. When you elevate religious works above acts of kindness, that's what hypocrisy is. And so, typically, holiness is characterized as elevating religious works above acts of kindness. It's separating yourself from a mischaracterization of what the world means, which is another whole huge topic of how the world isn't what religion teaches. The world doesn't mean those who are not of our denomination or those who are not, quote, believers, end quote. It actually is a basis of principles based on the idea of you are what you do and your value is how well you do it which is very much promoted by most of mainstream denominations. So, now that we've gone way off track, let's get back to what holy is. 
And so we first see this where we get to Moses in the burning bush. And it says in Exodus 3, 5, And he said, Draw not near here. Put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. So, I always thought this was weird. Like, why do you take off your shoes because it's holy ground? Like, if it's really something that is, you know, like you're profaning it by standing there, then the instructions should be like, back away, get away from here. You're standing on holy ground. How dare you profane it with your presence? Get away from here. But, I think that the idea is that the shoes are preventing direct contact. And so the idea is take off your shoes and have direct contact with this holy ground. Now, if holy is what I think it means, and it, it still does have the meaning where it relates to something that is dedicated to the priesthood. But we'll get to that. Um, so now in Exodus, here's just these are some weird passages here, because it's like holiness is communicable. So here we see Exodus twenty nine thirty seven. Seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. So. Sanctify means to make holy. It's also the same word as hallow also means the same thing. It means to make holy. So whatever holy means. And so most people say that means separate. But I think that what they're doing is they're confusing the fact that something is described as holy, meaning basically the industry of holiness. So you could have, say, medical equipment. And it means that stuff is separated out as being dedicated to the industry of medicine. And so it's medical equipment as opposed to, say, uh, some other kind of equipment that's non-medical. It's So what I'm saying is that if you have holy items, holy vessels, holy altars, holy oil, holy garments, that would be the same as saying, like, you have surgical equipment and surgical scrubs and surgical uh, uh, preparations and so forth. And so something is dedicated to the industry of medicine or surgery. And you have something dedicated to the industry of holiness. And so we've taken the idea that something is holy items and said holy means set apart, but it actually means set apart to the industry of holiness. So we still haven't defined what holy means because it's not set apart. Because if it's set apart, then medical means set apart because these items that are for medical use are set apart for medical use rather than some other kind of use. But you see that it's set apart to the industry of medicine. So something that's holy is set apart to the industry of holiness, whatever that means. But this is interesting. Whatever touches the altar shall be holy. It's like it's contagious. And then we have the same thing in Exodus 30, 29. You shall sanctify them and they shall be, uh, they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. So what is holy? Again, in Romans eleven sixteen, for the first fruit... If the first fruit be holy, the lump also is holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. Well, I think holy means whole, and whole means healthy. So holy has to do with healing. And here it's saying if the first fruit is whole and healthy and complete and the way that it's supposed to be, then the lump is also whole and healthy and complete and the way that it's supposed to be. And if the root is whole and healthy and complete then so are the branches. Then it references branches being broken off, which would be not whole. Now we get to Exodus chapter 20, 
and verse 8, and it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God, and in it you shall not do any work. Nor your son, your daughter, your manservant, or your maidservant, your cattle, not even the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And again, hallowed is the same as sanctified, which means to make holy. He blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So if holy means for healing, then this commandment is remember the Sabbath day and keep it for healing. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it for healing. If that's the interpretation, then you've got a total revision of what it means to be holy. Because what it means to be holy is to be a person who provides healing. And you don't provide healing through religious works. You provide healing through interacting with people in need and providing them with what they need. Which is consistent with what justice and mercy and righteousness are really about, which is upholding the weak in their time of need and restoring that which was lost. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we see here, The Lord shall establish you a holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto you, if you shall keep the commandments of the Lord God and walk in his ways. So again, we need to remind that commandment is not demand made under threat of penalty. God's not some deranged dictator demanding that you shut up and do what you're told. Jesus said, the Gentiles exercise lordship over you, but I rule by serving. God rules you by serving you, not by making demands of you. So commandment can't possibly be a demand made under threat of penalty because that's contrary to the nature and character of God, which means that commandment is guidance. So now it says, The Lord shall establish you a healing people unto himself, and he has sworn unto you, If you shall follow his guidance and walk in his ways, then you will be a healing people. Again, we reinforce this idea in Exodus 15, 26. And I said, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. So here it is, God saying, I'm a God that heals you. So that just goes to show you the importance of the idea of God the healer. Our Lord, our healer. The Lord who heals. And I think that it's actually most correct to say, I am healing. That God is healing. And this is where we get the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost from they accused Jesus of casting out devils by the prince of the devils. And he said, look, as long as you have this idea that there's some rival to God who heals people, which is the power only of God, exclusively a power of God to heal. And you think he's got some rival out there in order to trick people into a wrong doctrine? You're going to be completely stuck in this loop of fear and crisis until you get out of that and stop assigning healing to anyone other than God. Because God is healing. I am healing is the name of God. So now we get to Matthew chapter 6 and he says how to pray. And he says, after this manner, therefore pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I suggest that means healing is his name, which is what I just said, that his name is I am healing. Thy kingdom come. I suggest this is not speaking of the future 
as it is most commonly characterized. It's not, thy kingdom one day in 2,000 years will come. Thy will eventually, at the end of days, when you burn the fuck out of the rest of the earth and kill almost everybody, will be done, as it is in heaven. No, this says, thy kingdom is come, thy will is done, in earth, as it is in heaven. And here's important. In earth is not on earth. It's not on terra firma, the, the, the ground on which you walk and the community that you live in and the planet that you make your home. It's in earth. And earth is man because earth is what Adam is. Adam, Adama, in earth. In earth means in me. It means in you. Thy will be done in people as it is in heaven is what this is saying. That's why it's in earth and not on earth. And this is not something we're still eagerly anticipating one day when he destroys all of creation and makes the promise never to flood the earth again, a giant, giant loophole where, <laughs> well, I'm not going to flood it because I'm going to burn it. No, as far as I'm concerned, that's a lie then. That's not merely a loophole. I promise never to flood the earth again. That's a loophole that's so big it's a flat out lie. Just bar none. If you promise never to destroy the earth and you make a loophole of what method you choose not to destroy it by, that's just a lie. That's so mischaracterizing a promise that it's flat out a lie. And I don't even like to use that word. Anyone who knows me that knows that I don't call things lies unless they are vehemently wrong. So that's what it's saying. Thy kingdom is come. Thy will be done in me, in you, in each one of us, as it is in heaven. Now we get to the proof or evidence or whatever you want to call it between the importance of the word whole and the idea of healing. So whole clearly is oriented towards healing and related to healing. And I suggest that the similarity between the word whole and the similarity between the word whole and holy is not coincidental, but is actually because they are rooted in the same thing. And by the same way, you have in German the word heilig, which means holy, and the word heilung, which means healing. Again, a noticeable similarity in the sound of the word. And I'm suggesting that's not be, uh, not some coincidence of language, but is actually the result of being of the same origin. So whole and holy are the same thing, and whole means healing. So we read here, Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 20, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind and took behind him and touched the hem, hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. So she had a disease, and being healed from it is called being made whole. We have more parallels of this passage and I like the uh, couple differences that are in these ones in Mark and Luke. So we'll go to Mark. And it says, A certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and suffered many things of many physicians had spent all she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. So here it's emphasizing how much effort she's put into attempting to become healed of this issue. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may... But if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, said, Who had touched my clothes? And so then we get a little extended passage here where his disciples say, What are you talking about? There's people everywhere. Of course people are touching you. And he said unto her daughter, Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Go in peace and be healed of your plague. So whole is healed. 
And then I just want one more time here in Luke. I love this last this last phrase because this is where we get what salvation really is. Salvation is about this life. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. So this affirms that she is family. It affirms that comfort is something given by God. There's no devil out there trying to make you feel comfortable with who you are. There's no devil rival to God trying to make you think that you're okay just the way you are. There's nowhere that there's any time that some rival to God is called the comforter. Health, we dealt with that. The Pharisees accused Jesus of healing by the power of the devil, and he said, you need to get over this idea that God has some rival that heals people. And peace. Peace is not of the devil, okay? There isn't some rival to God going around unifying the whole world in peace so that God can burn the fuck out of it. Peace is not of the devil. Peace is of God. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. So these are the things that we affirm in the gospel. Family, comfort, health, peace, one body, one spirit. We are all one under one Father and Maker of all. The message is not some deranged fiction about how you can get God to change his mind about the depraved, abusive things he plans to do to you when you're dead. It's about this life and the the travails and the abuses and the problems that we go through here and now that we are all interdependent and we all have need of each other. And that is what makes it perfect because if everything was perfect in the way that people generally think perfect means, we would have no need of each other and we would not interact with each other because you would not deal with people you don't need. Because of our need for one of an, one another, because we are interdependent, that is what makes everything perfect. Now we go where he's being accused. Jesus is being accused of healing on the Sabbath. And they ask him in Matthew 12, 10, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? That they might accuse him of healing on the Sabbath. Because they probably had a wrong idea of what holy means. And remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. Became some kind of perversion of religious piety. And religious works and traditions of men that have nothing to do with the commandments of God. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? The very thing they were commanded to keep the day for is healing, that they might accuse him. And he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? They're so far off. He's using an example of a farm animal and how you would bother to be bothered to help that out on the Sabbath day. Regardless of whatever rules you think pertain to the Sabbath day. How much then is a man better than a sheep? It, wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. So he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole like as the other. And again, we see whole means healed. He stretched it forth and it was restored, healed like the other. Whole is healed. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council how they might destroy him. They wanted to kill him because he's healing on the Sabbath. He's doing the thing that the, the actual commandment in the book of Exodus said to do on the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. And again, he, here's another parallel of that story. And again, he entered into a synagogue and there was a man which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he said to them, 
So now Jesus is turning it around. He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he looked round about on them with anger, he's angry. Why? Because they think healing on the Sabbath is wrong. They think pick six days a week to, to help people, to heal people, to do good. But not on the Sabbath. On Saturday, you don't help people. On Saturday, you don't heal people. On Saturday, you stone people to death for picking up firewood, but you don't heal people. Whatever you do, don't be helpful on Saturday. I think I'd be a little angry too. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he said to him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And we looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. And again, they sought to destroy him. Whole obviously means healed. Now we've got a long story that's going to take some summarization because this is a long story in chapter 5 of John. And there's a man there and he's waiting by the waters for an angel to come and trouble the waters. And so the certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, he knew he had been there a long time in that case. And he said to him, will you be made whole? Which is to say, will you be made healed? And so he says, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled. You know, I didn't even plan on this. But I've heard so many people say word faith kinds of dog shit about this. Of like, oh, he had to let he had this victim and of course he did. I mean, come on, he wasn't that's exactly the problem the Pharisees had. That your your problem is your fault. I've heard this being mocked where people are like, the guys, oh can nobody there to help me. No, there was nobody there to fucking help him. Especially on Saturday. And so the impotent man answered him. The impotent man. Why is he being described as powerless, helpless, a victim? Not so you could mock him because he was, you know, trapped in some mentality that, ooh, if only he knew to name and claim his health, he'd have it. No, there is no magical health just because you believe it. If you have cancer, you have cancer. That's why the medical uh, field exists to heal people. It, I, I don't even want to get sidetracked here. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise up, take your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. On the same day was the Sabbath. So there's a whole problem because he healed the guy on Saturday, which is awful. So now we get to chapter 7 where this thing's really starting to cascade to its culmination. And about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knows this man letters, having never learned? And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man do his will, you should know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now he says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why go you about to kill me? Why does he say none of you keeps the law? Because the law said, remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. Remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. And they're saying, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? 
And so then they accused him of having a devil. Well, that sounds familiar. You're accusing, you're, you're healing people by the prince of the devils. And Jesus answered and said to them, I've done one work and you marvel. Moses gave you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, which means it's a tradition of men. And on the Sabbath day, you circumcise a man. On the Sabbath day, you have no problem performing an act of genital mutilation. But if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So he's saying, there's no wrong time for you to keep your religious works and to perform genital mutilation on somebody. No wrong time. Hey, if it's the eighth day, got to do it, right? Can't put it off to the ninth day or bump it up to the seventh day. Got to be on the eighth day. But when it comes to remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing, nope, can't do that. There's a wrong time to, to do healing. There's just no way you can possibly look at that and not think that's perverse. That's distorted. That's disgusting. That's abhorrent that they think they need to keep a law that says you perform genital mutilation, but you don't heal people, not if it's on Saturday. Then I love this. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Whatever righteous judgment is, however you want to define that, it's opposite of judging by appearances. And we have dealt with that, that righteous judgment is helping the needy. So judge not according to the appearance, but help the needy. Hmm. Heal people on Saturday. Remember the Sabbath and keep it for healing. That's interesting. So now we get Mark 2.27. This is, this is interesting now that we can put more context in this. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The day of healing was made for man. not man for keeping religious traditions about some abomination they call the Sabbath. Look at the importance of healing here. Look at how these ideas tie together and how forgiveness and kindness is tied to healing. So healing isn't just a matter of physical ailments of the body but it's something for the very soul and the mind and the heart. And we see that here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his healing name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Righteous judgment, helping of the needy. The Lord executes righteous judgment for all that are oppressed. That's helping the needy. That's healing the brokenhearted. That's going around and healing people from all kinds of disease within your capacity to do so. So now we finally get to this misrepresented passage in Hebrews 12. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And this is characterized as follow the Ten Commandments without which you can't die and go to planet third heaven where God is. But look at the association to healing. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make the paths straight for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which... No man shall see the Lord. 
but who's not seeing the Lord and when are they not seeing it? Follow peace with all men and heal because you are the light of the world. You are the one that is the image of the invisible God. And people believe in tragedy. People believe in pain. People believe in suffering. People believe in hopelessness. People believe in disease. People believe in death. But do people believe in people who are worth believing in? Do people believe in goodness? Do people believe in kindness? Do people believe in healing? Do people believe in restoration? So how are they going to see that? If you're the ambassador of Christ, then you don't present that to them. And instead you present them some bizarre lifestyle where you tell them, I don't do those things because I'm not of the world. All you're doing is alienating people, separating yourself from them, telling them that they're wrong to be who they are. They're not going to see the Lord because you're not showing it to them. No, instead, follow peace with all men and healing of others with which they shall see the Lord. And that's what that really means. So we're finally winding down. And just to emphasize the importance of healing, we've got a few passages here. Matthew 4.23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I'm beginning to think that preaching the gospel might possibly be related to healing. There's a little more here, though, because, as we know, names are representations of what a thing is. Jesus means salvation, or God is salvation or Savior. And Galilee has to do with a circle or a circuit, and it also means to roll away or remove. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, which is Mount Sinai, be removed and it shall crumble to the sea, and you'll have the thing that you believe, which is the removal of the law of Moses. Jesus went full circle around the circuit of removing of mountains, removing of the law of Moses, or better said, salvation, the Savior, went full circle around the whole circle, removing the law of Moses teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness. You need to get these deeper meanings that it's not just about a guy who went around doing some stuff, but that it's about the very nature and character of God, that salvation, God is salvation, removed that law of death and condemnation and genital mutilation and preach the gospel that is here and now it is Emmanuel, God with us and within us, who can never separate from the love of God because all things are upheld by his word. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. That's almost exactly the same quote here five chapters later in Matthew. The message that God is salvation, not God is angry, not God plans to torture you when you're dead, not God is some depraved, murderous, genocidal, homicidal maniac who demands you shut up and do what you're told or else. But God is salvation when about all the cities and villages. 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness. Uh, preaching the gospel and healing are probably completely unrelated to one another. But let's look. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Oh, we might have some trouble. I'm sure it's just another isolated coincidence between preaching the gospel and healing. Nothing to see here, folks. In Acts 10, it talks about Jesus, and it says, How God, uh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Whew. Good thing it doesn't mention preaching the gospel, or we'd have to think that preaching the gospel might be related to healing. Whew. Good job. Close call there. Close call. I think we can just keep those separate from each other. Now, here's one thing I wanted to point out, that if holy means healing, then God appointed the Savior with the healing ghost and with power. And I just want to take a sidetrack here with how we have in the King James Holy Ghost. And that's because... In the Latin, it was Sanctus Spiritus, which is the sacred spirit or the sanctified spirit, which is the same thing as holy. In German, the term was Heiliggeist. And Luther, Martin Luther, when he broke from the Catholic Church and he wrote his own Bible in German, he wrote things using the German uh, the German presentation of it, whatever, the German translation of it. So what we had was when the King James Bible was revised, they uh, wanted to use the Luther translation in order to distinguish itself as not in alignment with the Catholic Church. So this is how we get things like Jesus and Jerusalem and Jehovah rather than Jesus and Jerusalem and Jehovah. And we can see this here if we go over here. And this is from the 1611 and you can see here the way that Jesus is spelled. I-E-S-U-S. -S, and that's the 16, 1611 King James before the revision. Here's Jerusalem. Right there. And then here's Yehovah. So, what happened was, in order to use the we're not Catholic, we're aligning ourselves with Martin Luther way of spelling things, those I's were turned to J's. And so, Holy Ghost is the term that we got from the German Heiliggeist instead of the Latin Sanctus Spiritus. And that's where that comes from. That's how we get Jesus instead of Jesus. That's how we get Jerus or Jerusalem instead of Jerusalem. That's how we get Jehovah instead of Jehovah. It's because when those were brought over from German, the issue was the Germans still pronounced it with the Y sound. That's how they pronounced that letter. They still pronounced it, Jesus and Jehovah, because that's how Germans pronounced that letter. But in English, it has the Franco-English -Eng influence and the French influence of a J sound on the letter J is how that's pronounced. So you have like Jean-Jacques, you know, so then we end up with Jesus. And the English version of that's a little less soft and a little more of a punch to it. So instead of Jesus, it's Jesus. Instead of Jerusalem, it's Jerusalem. And that's the Franco-English in influence taken from the German spelling. spelling. And so let's close. Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river 
of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So we see a number of things there. The tree of life bare twelve manner of fruits, and the leaves of the tree of life were for the healing of the nations. And the other important thing to note here is they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. In order to see someone in their face, and we've kind of lost this in our culture, you have to be equal to them. When you owned a slave in those times or had someone even just socially lower than you, they had to downcast their eyes. They had to look down. You could not see each other face to face. To see God face to face means God doesn't tell you, point your eyes down, you plebe. How dare you look at me? It means he says, you're every bit as important to me as anything could possibly be. And so we look face to face where God bends down to you like a father bending down to see eye to eye to his son rather than towering over him to be equals. 